There's none like you. You alone are good. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your goodness, for your mercy. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the victory in every one of these situations and circumstances that were mentioned today. Lord, we celebrate the victory right now in Jesus' name. It is finished. It has been accomplished in the name of the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah, Lord. It is well with our souls. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise God. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Tim. Great as always. Thank you, Suzanne, Peter, and Tammy for leading us in worship. Praise God. And thanks to all of you, amen, for, for sharing what God has given you to, to share with us. Praise the Lord. I want to just mention briefly, and we'll, we'll deal with it more next week uh, for the sake of time, but uh, I had a talk with uh, Yvette last uh, Sunday after church. And those of you who haven't met her, she's a friend of Debbie's. She's a friend of mine. She's a part of the church. Praise the Lord. God bless her. Great to have her here. But she has a burden that the Lord's been dealing with her about, and uh, she would like to have a, like us to be able to make some clothes available to people who are in need. So it's like a clothes closet, which we had years ago before the flood and all that. What we're thinking about doing, because we don't have a lot of room downstairs uh, specifically for that purpose, is to do it on a monthly basis. So once a month on a Saturday, and we'll, we'll get details worked out and ironed out here, but uh, we'll bring clothing during the week or on Friday or Saturday, whenever it's convenient for you to do that. Uh, and we'll make it available then to the public, to anybody who has a need. If you know somebody that's going through some stuff or is laid off or is looking for work and doesn't have uh, maybe the clothes that they need to have, maybe it's kids, whatever it might be, uh, let them know that w one Saturday every month we'll open the doors to the church and we'll make everything that we have available. Now what we don't get rid of on that particular day will allow people to take whatever as much as they want and they can share it with other people, with friends, family, somebody they know something about that we don't know about or otherwise we'll give it to another uh, goodwill or somebody to where it will get to people, okay? But we'd like to make it something that's free so that people that really have a need will be able to do something for them. It's on Yvette's heart. We want to just help her to fulfill what God's calling her to do. And if he's speaking to somebody that's in this church, he must be speaking to the church. That's the way I look at it. So we want to do something to make that uh, possible. So we'll be talking about this over the next couple of three weeks, but we'll get it set up to where one Sunday or what, excuse me, one Saturday out of the month, we'll have it specifically for that purpose. And we'll see where we go from there. Okay. Praise the Lord. So be praying about it. See how God leads. Amen. But uh, that's our intention. Praise God. And I was thinking uh, while some of y'all were talking that I heard somebody say just the other day. So this isn't unique to me or it isn't something that I dreamed up. But um, some people say, well, you know, God does, isn't hearing me pray. And it's, uh, apparently someone who had this thought came to this guy and said, God's not hearing me pray. God doesn't listen to me. God doesn't hear me when I pray. And the man said, well, then just cuss me out. He said, what? He said, yeah, use some four-letter words. Just really bless me out. Just really cuss me. Use the foulest language you can think of and just work me over good. And the guy just looked at him. He said, are you kidding? And he said, no, what's the matter? Are you afraid God's going to hear you? Yeah. <laughs> God hears everything. Yes that goes on with us. Yes. We want to make it all about something bad that he's, you know, he's going to hear me if I say something bad. No, he hears every word that you speak. And he, he wants to act on those words. Yes, he does. That's the reason that we want to say what's in our heart and hopefully what's in our heart is the abundance of God's word because God is listening. He's listening to what we say and it isn't so he can punish us for saying bad words. It's so he can reward us for faith, for operating in agreement with him. So, Praise the Lord. That's, that's our intent. That's what we want to do. Amen. And uh, I was thinking uh, when Don was talking about how 
what we see is an illusion with our natural eyes. And it's kind of like, you know, you see uh, through a prism or like this time of year, especially when, it's, when it has snowed and then the sun's shining on the snow. And a lot of times you see these multicolors. It looks like it's almost like looking through a prism. You see a, a different colors, sunlight reflected. And uh, it's not an optical illusion. It just looks like one. <laughs> Praise the Lord. What I'm saying is that's the way it is in this, in this realm that we're dealing with, whether it's somebody that's sick or somebody that has a, a disease or somebody that's financially going through a bind or somebody has a relational situation. The truth is it's, it's not an optical illusion. It just looks like one. That's right. It's just how we perceive it, how we respond to it makes all the difference in the world. Praise the Lord. So uh, if you will... I want you all to help me stamp out, <laughs> abolish, end, put a stop to, and finish redundancy. Okay, praise the Lord. I'm gonna, I, I may come back to this later because I want to use the scripture, but there was a guy trying to understand the nature of God, and so he asked the Lord, he said, uh, God, how long is a million years to you? And God said, oh, a million years to me is like a minute. So the guy said, God, how much is a million dollars to you? And God said, well, a million dollars is just like a penny to me. And finally, the guy asked God, he said, could you give me a penny? Yeah. And God said, just a minute. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Actually, we'll use that scripture later, maybe. But. So here, here I, I, I want to preface before we actually get to the scripture that I want to use this morning. But God gave us, human beings, dominion. Amen. He gave us authority. Yeah. Without reservation. That's what he gave to man when he created man. Mm -hmm. Right? Well, Adam sold out to Satan. He gave that dominion and that authority to Satan. All right? Well, Jesus, God, yes. comes in the flesh as a man, and he defeats the enemy yes. to receive that or to get that dominion back and the authority back. That's what his purpose was in coming. It wasn't just to deal with sin. It was just a, a, something that had to be dealt with, but it wasn't the main focus. The focus was to get man back in the position yes. of authority and dominion in the earth. Amen. Now... In Matthew 28, Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. In other words, he's saying, because I got this power back now. And every human being, every man who's a believer has power and has authority. So go in that power and that authority to act. That's what we're talking about here this morning. That's our future. Amen. That's the future of God in this earth. So, amen. He said, I give you power. In Luke, he said, I give you power over all the power of the enemy. Yes. Now, the devil has the only weapon he's got is our ignorance. So he uses fear. The reason he uses fear is to get us out of faith. To get us thinking about the illusion instead of the truth. So whenever we're under attack... How does your attack come? Yep. It comes from something physical. It comes from something natural uh -huh. that you have to defeat. You have to overcome it. How did Jesus overcome all those obstacles that the devil brought against him? The Word of God. Yes. That's the weapon. That's the only weapon that really works. Because even if you don't have faith in the Word of God yet, if you say it enough, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You'll develop faith just by saying what God says no matter what. Yes. Amen. So that's, a, that's the challenge. Praise the Lord. Now here's the deal. We are heaven's ambassadors. We are in this world, but we're not of this world. We've been born again. We were born from above. So we're not earthly. Although we have a physical body, and the reason we have that physical body is because it gives God legitimacy or gives God a legitimate legal right to operate in the earth. He can only yes. do it through people. Yes. That's why He redeemed us, yes. so that He can influence the earth again. But He has to do it through people, and that will only happen through people who know 
that they have this dominion and they have this authority. Yes. Amen? So we've got heaven, we've got eternity. Jesus said, pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He told us we could bind things on earth, bind things in heaven, loose things on earth, loose things in heaven. Right? So he's talking about, he uses this kind of a, uh, it's a juxtaposition in a way of heaven, because we think of it spatially, we think of it as some place, some geographic thing. And, and same way with eternity, we think of it more as eternities in heaven right. rather than eternities in us. Yeah. And heaven is in us. He said, the kingdom's in you. What kingdom? The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom yes. of God. And we have the Holy Spirit, which is God in us or Christ in you, the hope of glory, however you want to word it. It's the same thing regardless. Amen. So what we're talking about is access, accessing the supernatural. This is what Adam had, and this is what Adam gave up. Yeah. Because once he gave it up, then he was stuck with what he could get physically. Right. God says, now by the sweat of your brow. Now it's going to be strictly this body that's going to be performing and functioning and providing and doing whatever else it is you've got to have. Right? Yeah. God had given him, he breathed in him the ruach or the, the spirit of life, amen, so that he could function in relationship with God rather than having to do things physically. His physical body just gave him a legal reason or right to be on the earth, right. period. It's the only thing the body was for, that and, and procreation or to, you know, to further the population. All right, so with that in mind, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 9 through 12. And my, my argument is, or my kind of theory thesis, whatever you want to call it, based on the Word of God, is that the, thing, the only thing holding us back is our awareness, our consciousness of who we are. What did yes. we hear God say to people yes. who were witnessing here today? God was just telling them the truth about themselves. Yes. Right? You have power. Yes. You have dominion. You yes. have authority over every physical thing in this yes. earth. But you've got to know it, and you've got to act on it. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. So, we know in part, we prophesy in part. Now, he's talking about the physical man, the natural man, okay? Intellectual person, right? We know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. What's perfect? What is the perfect thing that comes? The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. Right. Jesus said it himself, you, you call me good. He said, there's only one that's good, that's God, right? Yes. So when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child. In other words, when I was immature, when I first got born again, or however long it was that I didn't have revelation, I just had religion. Right. I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became mature, when I grew up into all that I was, I put away childish things. Yeah. For now... We see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Now he's using the previous words that he used, and he's speaking here in that same uh, tense, yeah. right? He said, I was a child. Yeah. I spoke as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, he's speaking theoretically now. When, I, when a person's little, they act like a kid when they, you know, yeah. but when they grow up, yeah. right. right, they, yeah. they use the, the, the information, the intellect, the revelation, whatever it might be. But he says, for now we see through a glass darkly. But when we become mature, yeah. now I'll, what I know in part, then I'll know even as also I am known. Okay? We see through a glass darkly. Philippians 3, 12 through 16. He's speaking spiritual things to spiritual people who are not functioning spiritually. Right. He is. So not as though I had already attained, this is Paul, had attained what? That maturity, that thing that we were just reading about in Colossians, or in, uh, yeah, in Colossians, or Corinthians, excuse me. Paul wrote both, but here's Paul speaking again. Now he's, he's, writing to the Philippians church, and he says, now I haven't reached that place yet where I see it all perfectly and understand it all perfectly, right? But I follow after it, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended 
of Christ Jesus to make you fully mature, make you use your authority and your dominion. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, that word is mature, as many as be perfect or mature, be thus minded. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, or in anything that you're not thinking from mature thoughts, God will reveal even this to you. Yes. I'd say that's exactly what Don had. Yes. God revealed what he wasn't right. fully matured in. Right? right? Yes. It's not against Don. I'm saying that's, the, that's us. That's why we yes. call, cry out to God. That's why we're saying, hey, give me a break here. I need some insight. I'm not getting this because my natural man is fighting everything about it. It's got all this history. It's got all this yeah. years of trying and doing and this and that and the other thing and all the, all the natural reasons for me to not see clearly right. what I am. Right. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. So wherever, wherever you have operated, think about Jane's healing. All of us have had some kind of supernatural intervention or, or interaction in our life. Yeah. That's what he's talking about. Think about that or as was said earlier, think about the pillars. Think about something yes. where I have worked in that area. Amen. And then walk by that rule. Yes. Whatever made that happen is what you need to be operating by in every other area of your life. In other words, by faith you need to trust that what I've said, I'm going to do it no matter what it looks like. Right. That is right. Let us mind the same thing. Yes. Let us think the same way. Yeah. Spiritually, right? All right. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. We are. Here, now, this moment, the moment you got born again. Yet it doesn't appear that we sh what we shall be. In other words, we are right now yes. everything we're ever going to be as far as God's concerned, and yet for some reason it doesn't seem to manifest. It, doesn't, it isn't appearing to me. Right. All right? But when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. Yes. For we shall see Him as He is. Praise the Lord. Now if you go back to uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verse 12, He says, Now, we see through a glass dimly. I know, I see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now in part, but then I'll know even as I'm known. Okay, then I'll know me the way God knows me. Yes. Right? God knows what power you have. He knows what authority. The devil knows. Yes. That's why Suzanne said what she said. That's why he's attacking every area where you have dominion, where you have authority, where you have power. Yes. Praise the Lord. So here's the deal. In the days that this was written, they didn't have glass mirrors. They had bronze mirrors. Okay, so if we think of a modern mirror, when we read this in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, it robs you of the force of Paul's illustration of what Paul's really trying to get across to us. His point was that the reality of eternity, the reality of God, the reality of heaven, is so far beyond our present ability to comprehend in the natural, yeah. we can only see through a glass darkly. Yeah. We have to walk by and see by faith. Yes. Praise the Lord. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. What's the newness of life? Our new identity, uh, yeah. who we really are, what the Spirit says we are. The only way you can do that is by faith. Because yeah. your mind will fight it yeah. every opportunity, yeah. everywhere it can. It wants to keep you in the flesh. In other words, operating by the senses, by what your physical body can connect with. Amen? Yes. All right. Romans 8, verse 1 through 7. See, I'm t what I'm talking about this morning, and I, we've talked about it before to some degree, but here's the damn 
unpredictable thing about religion. What religion does is keep you focused on your physical person. Yes. Absolutely. Depriving you of the authority and the dominion and the power and the relationship that God has for us. So it does just the opposite of what you would think it's supposed to do. It traps us in a place where Satan can come back and work on us and affect us and impact us. Amen. So there is therefore now no condemnation to those or them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. That's not talking about shooting craps or getting drunk or getting high. Those are not things we want to be doing but I'm just saying walking after the flesh is allowing your senses to dominate. Yes. I got this pain. Oh, well, that's probably going to be liver, cancer, you know, whatever. That's what we do. Instead of saying, by his stripes I was healed. Right? That's what, that's what we're talking about. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. The law was righteous, just that nobody could keep it. Right. Well, it's been kept, and God has accounted that to us as though we had kept the law perfectly. Yes. Amen. So the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Again, every one of us know we fail right. the legal aspects of this thing. Right? And if that's our focus, then we're always under condemnation. We're, yes. we're, why? Because we're going by our senses. Yes. But the Spirit says we are the righteousness of yes. God in Christ. Yes. Therefore, we have authority and power and dominion in this earth that no normal or average human being has. They are subject to these conditions. We are not. We're not of this world. We're just in this world. And the authority that we have with us that has come from the other realm, from the spirit realm, is exercisable, if that's a word, in this realm. Yes. But it only operates by faith. Yes. Right. So for it to be carnally minded is death. Carnally minded just, it doesn't mean you're thinking pornography, you know, pornography. Yes. It just depends on where you put the accent, right? But I'm just saying, it is, that isn't what he's talking about. The carnal mind, isn't, that isn't what that is. The carnal mind is just a mind that operates solely by the impulses and the impressions that it gets from the body. The spirit mind is one that's been renewed to the Word of God, and it doesn't let the 6 o'clock news determine how my, the rest of my day is going. Right? So I, I'm not affected by it. I'm subject to it, but I don't have to submit to it. I'm in the world where this body works that way, but I don't have to let that control me because I have a greater power. I have, I'm, I'm mature so that I don't let the childish things rule me anymore. All right? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God because it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. It's an enmity with God. In other words, it butts heads with God every time because God has said, by my stripes you're healed. But the carnal mind says, but the doctor said, and they've got a history of how many other people have had this and how their outcome came. And after all, mom had it or grandpa had it or somebody else had it. So, you know, that's what I'm saying. That's the conflict here. That's what, that's what the struggle is about. All right. Second Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verses 6 and 8. Second Corinthians 5. Verse 6 and 8. Now, therefore, we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Yes. Now, that's interesting. I used to always equate that to being alive or dead. But that's not what he's talking about. He's saying, we are confident, I say, therefore, we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the flesh, while we are at home allowing the sense realm to do dominate and to dictate us, yeah. then we are absent from the Lord. Because you can't be in both places at the same time, right? So we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. In other words, I'm not going to let, we're more than happy and willing to not let my physical body and, and senses dictate to me what my life is. Amen. I want to be present with the Lord. I want to be conscious yes. of what God's saying and what God is doing in any given situation in order for me to be absent from the body. Yes. To not be influenced or affected 
totally by it. All right, now let me back up because I was looking at this before church and it made me think about this because you might say, well, you're just taking that out of context. But go back to the chapter 1, or excuse me, uh, verse 1 of the same chapter, chapter 5 and verse 1. Is that a problem going backwards now once we've been there? Okay, so now, now look at what he's saying. For we know that if our earthly house, our flesh, of this tabernacle, the thing that holds God's presence, we are the temple of God, right? Our body is that. If it were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Spirit man. For well, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, okay, verse 2. Now look at, the, look at the language. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house. Or in other words, having something for this spirit to dwell in that isn't going to be totally influenced by the flesh. So this is the... Groaning. This is where we are, church, yeah. in history, in church history, in the prophetic word of God. Yes. This is where we are at. We've read it many times, but it's had more, it has more significance to me now and more impact when I read it than it has at any time in my life. Yeah. Yes. So, with our house, which is from heaven, yes. so that if so that being clothed, we shall not be found naked or spiritual, not spiritual, unspiritual. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, not that we don't want a body, right. but we just don't want the body to be the dictator of everything, that, that influences everything, but clothed upon. In other words, absent from the body, present with the Lord. It's the same language that he's using, okay? That mortality might be swallowed up in life, in eternity, in eternal life, in God life. Because yes. we know... By natural definition, mortality is life. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Until, until you die, and yeah. then your mortality is visible. Yeah. You, you're mortal. Yeah. You're not going to live forever. All right? So that this limited thing, right, yeah. doesn't dominate. So it's swallowed up by the spiritual. Yes. yes. So the spiritual is dominating the physical. physical. The mature is now ruling over right. the immature. Right. Now, he that hath wrought us for that self same thing. So, in other words, God, this is the reason God created us. Yes. Who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Yes. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, yep. we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Why? Because that's the only way. You can be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Right. Praise the Lord. W without dying. Because once you die, it's automatic. You're in the Spirit. You'll, there'll be no more influence of the flesh. But we can have it. That's what he's telling you. You can have it now. You're supposed to have it now. You don't have to wait until you die to experience this. Because this experience is what changes everything around you. Praise the Lord. Revelation uh, 21, 21. Just for an example now, just to carry this a little bit further. And I'm not saying heaven isn't everything we've thought it is. I'm just saying from an earthly perspective, we look at it as some place off in the distance where it's, you know, beautiful San Diego weather without earthquakes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, perfect all year round and never too hot, never too cold. Nobody ever gets angry. Nobody ever gets upset. I'm not saying that isn't true. I'm saying there's something more that God's trying to get us to understand because we don't need that information about a place. Right. We need information about us here and now if we're going to have any kind of an influence. This isn't just about feeling good about dying. Right. It's good to have that because we don't fear it, but at the same time there's something far more relevant that God's trying to deal with us. So the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every se several gate was one of pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold as if it were transparent glass. So, streets of pure gold. I don't believe in streets of pure gold. <laughs> okay, blasphemy, I know. But what I'm saying is, based on the other scriptures that we read, God is trying to enable us to grasp a vision of glory that is unimaginable yes. with a natural mind. Yes. 
So he uses something that we can relate to. It's the parables. It's, it's how Jesus teaches. He gives us something that the natural mind can relate to. And then he expounds on it in, in this dramatic, you know, outrageous way. Trying to say, look, no matter how you try to imagine this, it's greater. No matter how you imagine to dream it up, it's going to be better. No matter what you think about this, is it going to be this way? Is it, oh, what about my fan? What about this? What about that? Will I have that? He's saying, you know, you're wasting your time. Because what I've got for you is so much better than anything you have ever experienced or ever could. Now, we base all of our future on the present. I want it to be this perfect. I want it to be this thing, and I want it to be, but I want it to be perfect. That will be heaven. Right? Family, everything's going to be just like it is here, only it just will not, it won't be flawed in any way. It'll just be idyllic. There's nothing wrong with thinking that way. I'm just saying God's trying to give a... He, he, if you think you're going to give something up, something here that you won't have there, believe me, you're not going to miss it. You're going to, it's going to be, you're going to be so blessed. It's going to be so glorious. Yes. Yes. But we're limited to what we know sure. and understand here. So we fear even some of that, that we won't have everything that we had here. Right. Right. Or it'll be different in some way. I, maybe it's just me that feels that way, okay? But I'm just saying what God keeps t telling me is no matter what it is, it's going to be better. Yes. You're not going to, it's not going to, you're not going to have a trade-off. You're not going to have to give up something to get something. It's going to be so outrageously glorious. I can't even give you anything to relate to. Praise the Lord. So in the Bible, just think of the, in Bible days, the streets were dirt. Or at the very best, they were rocks. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Today, what are our roads? They're dirt roads. Very few of them left around anymore. Gravel roads. There's even few, becoming fewer and fewer of those than there was when I was a kid. Every road outside of town was gravel, with the exception of, you know, Highway 65 or something. But now it's, gra it's dirt, it's gravel, it's tar or asphalt. Or else it's concrete. Now think about it. I know it costs money to build these things, but I'm saying you're talking about the cheapest, uh, most uh, abundant, available things. Right? I mean, I know rock is expensive. Do the you know, the parking lot. And I'm saying, but in comparison, in the earth, it's, it's one of the cheapest, most abundant things that are out there. Any one of those. Concrete, asphalt. Rock, dirt, right? It's everywhere. So the most abundant, the most available, the most worthless materials in the greater world, in the spirit realm, the eternal world, everything is so glorious that it will be as though gold, the most precious commodity that we have here on earth, in this present natural experience, is relatively worthless in the royal economy. Yeah. Yeah. That's the message he's trying to get us to understand. Not that the streets, I won't be disappointed if the streets aren't gold. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Because gold won't mean anything in heaven. Right. It's meaningless. It's only meaningful here. Right? right? right. We don't need gold in heaven. No. <laughs> right? We probably don't even really need streets. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, I'm not saying we won't have any. I'm just saying to get this, to try to project this, that it's all about gold and streets and gates of pearl is simply missing the point that it's just something so outrageously glorious that we can't relate to it. So he's trying to give us something that will hook up with us. Gold! Man! Think of it. Whatever it is, $1,000 an ounce or something. Maybe $1,500. It goes up and down all the time. Whatever it is, it's nothing up there. It's stuff you'll skip across a pond. Right? Throw at the annoying animals. Of course, there won't be any of those, will there? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah. Isaiah 11, speaking of animals, look at Isaiah 11, verses 6 through 10. I'm, I'm using these different illustrations because I know you know them, but I'm, I'm doing it because I, if I am redundant, it's because we... We've got to change the way we think. Yes. We can't just heighten our awareness or think deeper thoughts. We need to change how we think. 
in order to do what it is God has called us to do. Yes. So the wolf also shall lay down, will dwell with the lamb. This is talking about in the future. The leopard will lay down with the kid, calf with the young lion, fattling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall feed their young ones, shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The suckling child will play on the hole of an asp, of a poisonous snake, right? Mm -hmm. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. No problem. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the Lord shall be full of the knowledge, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand up for an ensign of the people, to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Praise the Lord. So, thinking of what Jane said about the rest, Here, there it is. It's Jesus. It's trusting him. It's resting in him, right? So the future reign of the Messiah, or Jesse's branch, which is Jesus, amen, and us by extension, we are the offspring, right? His, uh, he's our older brother, the firstborn of many brethren, praise the Lord. So he says that this reign is going to be characterized by a level of peace and harmony that today is inconceivable to us. I mean, we can't even get two people to get along let alone vicious animals, right? right? I mean, he's, he's showing us that what I have for you, you can't even, you can't even imagine it. Right. I'm going to give you some little things here to try to help you to see what it is, but it's just going to be so outrageously unlike what you're used to. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. It's the Holy Spirit's way of putting the reality of infinite peace in practical terms that are understandable to finite minds. Yes. That's it. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. A day is with the Lord as a thousand years, a thousand years as one day. Right? So, like the joke I was telling you, the million dollars or a penny, and he says, give me a penny, and the Lord said, wait a minute. Right? See, in the natural world, we experience time in a very specific way. It's, it's taught us from day one. Right? And it's hard for us, if not impossible for us, in the natural, to imagine things differently. What has been, will be, blah, 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 blah. You know, I, this is my experience, my life experience. I've seen it with other people. I've seen this, seen it happen. I know how it works, you know. Things start going downhill. This is the way it is, you know, and on and on and on. So back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. He that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Amen? The way this body functions is in time and space. It's bound by it. It's stuck with it. That's why you have to be operating by the Spirit or you're subject to the laws, the diseases, the poverty, the whatever else goes on around you. So the truth is, time itself is simply a dimension, amen, of the created universe, which we are physically a part of. Time didn't exist until the earth existed. Then God made time. You read it, the sun, the, the, the dark, the sky, so on and so forth, right? So it, all, all time is is a dimension of a created universe that physically we're a part of. Right, yeah. Amen. All right? So we measure days and years by the behavior of the solar system, yeah. right? A day is a complete revelation of the earth on its axis. That's one 24-hour period. That's a day. A year is the time that it takes the earth to orbit the sun. 365 days, right? Or leap year. So the motions of the earth 
do not apply to heaven or eternity. No. They can't or there wouldn't be such a thing as eternity. They're only a part of the made up illusion of a world. It doesn't exist in reality, not in the eternal, not in the thing that never changes. It only exists here in a temporary condition. All right? So, being confined to time in, in this universe, right, makes it hard to imagine existing outside of time. If not impossible to the average person. All right? That's what 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 6 and 7 is talking about. In fact, that whole fifth chapter is talking about being confined to space and time or physical bodies. All right? So as physical beings located in space, we naturally default to thinking of heaven as a place or a location. Because that's all we know. That's all we have ever experienced naturally. That's why when we encounter God, it's so weird. Because you're outside of time. All of a sudden, all the things that have kept you are gone. And it's like you're, you're strictly operating by the Spirit, which is what exactly is happening. He's communicating with your spirit, and your flesh is outside the picture. Right? Now, even, even in a church service where the Spirit of God moves and we're touched by it, our flesh doesn't really know what to do with it. And that's why we got the shouts. That's why we got the running. That's why we got the leaping and everything else. And the reason is not because that's the Holy Spirit, but because when the Holy Spirit moves in a dramatic way, you don't know what to do with it. Because it doesn't fit the paradigm for a facial, physical, timed body. That's right. So it just reacts. Yeah, it does. All right? It's not wrong. It's, it's just that, you know, we've made, in Pentecost especially, we've made it more about that yeah. uh -huh. than we have about the thing that's causing that. Right. Which is our struggling with these two natures, with the spirit and the flesh. Yeah. Okay? So, a physical being located in space, we think everything has to be the same way. Heaven has to be somewhere out there. There has to be a map to it. There has to be a way to get there. There has to be streets of gold. There has to be mansions. There has to be all these things that only, the only reason we think they have to be there is because that's the thing that we have here. So it can't just be a house. It's got to be a mansion. It's got to be something way beyond what we have here because it's heaven. Okay? So we we are encouraged to think this way by the Bible itself. Because the way he presents it, he's presenting it to people who have never known anything but this. So he uses the parables and the way that he talks. The scripture portrays everything is spatial. You know, it's the spatial images of God in heaven. Like a location somewhere and... and why? Because it agrees with our experience in the earth. So it makes God accessible to some degree for the immature or for the newborn or born again or somebody who's wanting to be born again. Am I making sense? Okay, so how we see ourselves is obviously dominated by time, by space, and by matter. Taste, touch, smell, see, hear. Okay? What if heaven is not so much a different place as just a different way of existing? See, God is trying to get heaven to the earth. How does it work in heaven? Well, first of all, there is nobody sick in heaven. But if somebody somehow, some way could possibly get sick, all you'd have to do is say, you're not sick. Right? Because we don't exist under the same conditions or the same rules or regulations in that realm. This is what he's trying to get us to understand. Heaven, don't, I mean, heaven is, we're going to go to heaven, okay? So I'm, I'm not arguing that. I'm just saying, but the point is, 
he's not trying to make heaven a, a different location. He's trying to make heaven a different way to live, a different way of existing so that heaven can exist on earth, so that people aren't in the hospital with disease, so people aren't marriages being broken up and children being preyed upon and, and poverty and, and hatred and all the things. Praise the Lord. So look at John chapter 14 and verse 2. Unless you get your mind renewed to the Word of God. In other words, unless you start thinking outside of the conditions of earth, right. you're stuck with it. Yes. You've got to die to get the benefits of heaven. Right. That's not the way God intended it. He intended heaven to invade the earth through people who had a legal right to be here, but could give access to the Spirit of God so that heaven could rule on earth. So the devil wouldn't keep giving people diseases. So the devil wouldn't keep destroying marriages. So the devil wouldn't keep uh, creating poverty situations and so on and so forth. In my father's house are many mansions. You all know I've taught on this before. I'm going just a little bit different way this time, but it's still in the context of what I've taught in the past. I, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Again, Jesus is using the stuff that we can understand. He's, he's using language that we can relate to, right? Now, we're in 21st century U.S., right? So we think of home as a place with immediate family. You know, our parents, our grandparents, if they're still living, they got their own place. Right? They got their own home. Our children, when they get older, they get their own home. See what I'm saying? Amen? So to us, we've got a house. And we've got rooms. Right? In the house. And in our house, you've got rooms for cooking. You've got rooms for sleeping. You've got rooms for eating. You've got rooms for watching TV. Right? All of that stuff. That's the way we think of it. All right? John 14, verse 10 through 20. Praise God. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me... The works that I do, shall he do also. Greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Yes. Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. If you love yes. me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth. Jesus is saying, what I've got, I'm going to give you. The Father's in me. I'm in the Father. Whatever I do, it's not me that does it. It's the Father that's in me. He does it. And he said, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give you the same thing so that you can do even greater works than these. Yeah. Amen. I'm going to my Father and I'm sending back this thing that is in me, the Spirit of God that is in me that has allowed me to have the ministry that I've had. Right? Yes. You're going to have it. You're going to get yes. the same thing. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive right. because it doesn't see him. It, it can't capture him with, a, with the natural senses, right? right? Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, because he dwells with you, and he shall be in you. Yes. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But you see me, because I live, you shall live also. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. You talk to an unbeliever, and you try to tell them yeah. about Jesus. I can't see it. Yeah. You know, I just don't get it. I don't... 99% of the Christian population have never seen, with these eyeballs, Jesus. Yes. But every one of us have seen Him. Yes. We're spiritualized. Yes. Otherwise, we couldn't believe on Him. That's right. this, is how we, this is how you function in the spirit realm. Ears to hear, but they don't hear. Right? Exactly. We've got ears to hear and do hear because we hear the Father say to us. Yes. You may have had an audible voice. Most people never get the audible voice, but they still hear. Yes. Somehow we're motivated. We're moved to do certain things. Yes. Right? God speaks to us. Yes, He does. 
Praise the Lord. Yes. All right. 1 Corinthians uh, 13, verses 9 through 12 now again. Well, Jesus is saying, we've got exactly the same thing He had. Yes. When He was here doing the things He did, raising the dead, casting out demons, He's saying, you have the very thing same thing. I'm sending back the Spirit so that you and the Father will be one. Yes. I'll be in you. You'll be in me. We'll be in Him. Yes. yes. Not after we die. Now. The moment you get born again, you have that. Yes. But He says in another place, talking about the immature, He said, if you don't know it, you're the same as a servant. Right? right? right. Because it isn't until you know what you have, yeah. that you can function yes. in what you have. So we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Right. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, we see through a glass darkly, but then when we become mature, when we understand, we'll see face to face. Yes. Yes. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Because we are a reflection yes. of Jesus. Yes. If we ever see ourselves as we truly are, you're going to see Jesus. Yes. Yes. Now again, I'm not talking natural here. But that's the problem we have as being natural people. We want to see yes. Jesus. Yes. We would see Jesus, you know. Yes. And God said, I'm right here. Yes. Just see yourself as you really are, and you'll see Jesus. Yes. Praise the Lord. So we look at Jesus' words and we think he's promising square footage, you know, a mansion. Some place where we can hang our own pictures. Right? And, and, uh, and stay up late and watch TV if we want. But that's not what he's talking about. Jesus was speaking to Jewish listeners and a house was a multi-generational extended family for them. Praise the Lord. Jesus' illustration was just a way of reaffirming the Father's intention of reconciling us to Him as sons and daughters, as part of His family. Instead of offering us a room, Jesus is saying we're going to be part of the family. You're God's family. You're God's yes. children. You're yes. His offspring. You yes. have an inheritance. Yes. All that He is. Yes. All that He has. Yes. It's yours. Yes. Praise the Lord. John 17, 21 to 24. You know, I'm excited about heaven, but I don't really think about it that much because I know it's a waste of time. Because yeah. I have no idea. I'm just, I'm just going to be so excited when it happens. Yeah. Praise the Lord. It'll be more than any, anything I could have ever imagined. What I'm thinking about is heaven here. Yes. Because this is where I am. This is what I'm doing now. I'm not worried about what I'm going to be doing 10 years from now or 20 years from now or, or 5 minutes from now for that matter. What, what we need to be concerned about is what are we going to do now? Yes. Right. Absolutely. Yes. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Yes. I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, mature. Yes. And that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them, and has... Thou hast loved me. How, did that, how does that happen? Jesus said, don't, you don't have to believe me for what I'm saying. Believe me for the work's sake. Yeah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. There needs to be some resurrections. There yeah. needs to be some dramatic healings and some outrageous things that point to God that we, can't, we don't even have to worry about. It. They're going to say, that was God. That was a miracle. That was something that outside of what human beings can do. Yeah. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. How are we going to see the glory of God? As it's manifested in the earth. The glory is going to overwhelm this entire earth. Amen? The darkness will be gross darkness. Amen? But he said the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. 
in the darkest times is when God's glory is going to shine the brightest, when it's going to be the most relevant. Praise the Lord. John 17, verse 3. I'm just saying we've got to change the way we think. We've got to, we've got to get a little crazy here, I mean, from a natural perspective, in order to ever get to the place. They thought Jesus was nuts. His own brothers and sisters thought he was crazy. Why? Because he thought so differently. He just operated so separate from the way they did. I'm not saying we just be crazy for the sake of being crazy. I'm saying... If we look, seem to be crazy because we're operating based on what the Word of God says, let the chips fall where they may. I mean, they can think I'm crazy. I've been, I've been called crazy for a lot of less reasons and yeah. less worthwhile reasons, praise the Lord. But this is eternal life, or life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Now, he's talking about here, yeah. yes. based on the context of what we just read. Same chapter, just back earlier, right? This is eternal life. Yes. That they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent, which Jesus goes on to say in chapter 17. That's what this was all about. Us getting into Him, Him getting into us, and us yes. getting into God, and then God getting the glory. Yes. All right? So heaven is a relational reality. Yes. Praise the Lord. It's not a place. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Eternal life is relational reality not a period of time? This is eternal life, yes. that you know God. Yes. This is eternal life. It's a relationship. Yes. It's relational. It's not geographic. It's not Hallelujah. spatial. It's not time. It's relationship. Yes. Yes. Okay. So that's what I'm saying is, if I'm thinking, I and the Father are one. Yes. Or we could say it this way. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. It's, say, it's a saying the same thing. It's His righteousness that He has given to me. Yes. But I and my Father are one. If I'm thinking that, it's not a huge leap for me then to lay hands on the sick and see him recover. It's only when I'm living a natural life and then all of a sudden I'm confronted with a, a spiritual attack now I've got to revamp everything. I've got to reset all of my, you know, uh, logistical way of doing things. Yeah. And now I'm more the guy who's affected by the diseases than the guy who affects the disease. Yes. That's the difference between Jesus and the average person. Yeah. He was always aware of the Father's presence. That doesn't make you a weird freak. You can still have a normal life. You're just conscious yes. that I and the Father are one. Yes. He doesn't just show up when I get drunk. Right. You know, right. to rebuke. He doesn't just show up if, if I get angry and swear. Right. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. This is one of the reasons for grace. He's always, always there. Yes. Yes. He's not judging. The judgment has taken place. Yes. He's there to make you everything you are supposed to be. Why? Because without you being everything you're supposed to be, He can't be everything He's supposed to be. That's what the world is looking for. Not religion, not some other uh, gr group or, or clique or clan. They're looking for God. And we tried to give them a bunch of rules and regulations and confinements and and guilt and shame and everything else and try to pass that off as God. Get this, you're really going to be happy. Right. No, you're going to be more miserable than you were before you knew that there was a God. That's right. Praise the Lord. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Think about it. If I'm in the body, sickness can come on me. Because this is, outwardly we're all perishing. Right? But inwardly, we're renewed day by day. Yes. Mm -hmm. So when I'm in the flesh, I am subject to everything mm -hmm. of the flesh. Mm -hmm. Everything that's in this natural world can impact me yes. in the flesh. Right. Disease, poverty, yeah. broken relationship, you can name it. Yep. This body is subject to all of that. But if I'm absent from the body, yes. in other words, if the body is no longer... The criteria that defines me. Yes. 
then those things have no impact on me anymore. I impact them. Yes. This is what Jesus did. He was, he was in the world, but he wasn't of the world, and he knew it. He knew this body just gives me a legitimate right to go around healing the sick, casting out demons, and, and bringing the presence of God into yes. people's lives. That's the only reason I've got this body. Jesus. So I'm only going to use it in the ways that it benefits my purpose. Yeah. It'll get me. Somebody said, uh, you know, what's everything's within walking distance if you got the time. <laughs> right? I mean, Jesus went about healing everybody. Yeah. He did. Wherever he went, he just stayed focused on the fact that he wasn't in the body. Oh, right. He had a body. He was in a body, but he wasn't of a body. He was of a spirit. Spirit is our identity. Spirit is who we are. Spirit is what we are. And that's why it's so contradictory when we get into a hospital situation or a financial situation. And everybody else wants to give you more information. Wait a minute. You're acting crazy because you don't seem to understand. I've got some facts here. I've got some history here I can give you. I've got some experiences that I can share with you. And we're going, whoa, wait a minute. I don't care about your history. I don't care about your experience. I don't even really care about your facts. All I care about is the truth. Yes. And the truth is that by His stripes, we're healed. Hallelujah. By His stripes, we are delivered. Amen. He became poor that I become rich. Amen. He suffered rejection from everybody so that I don't have to go through broken relationships and all of these other things. Jesus. But see, He's trying to get us to change our mind in the everyday aspect of life so that we don't get blindsided by the enemy and then we got to come up with a plan yeah, right, right. the plan is built in it's 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 designed in us it's pre-programmed yes. in us as spirit beings praise the Lord so heaven absent from the body present with the Lord if I'm absent from the body and I'm present with the Lord disease has no none. way to attach itself to me yes. sickness poverty none of those things have a way of getting to me heaven, eternity. That's the promise of being with God, right? That's what we think of, heaven, we're going to be with the Lord. You're with Him. Right now, right here. We're just not relationally conscious. We only think of Him when we have a need or when something weird happens or you know, I'm, I'm talking about typically. I'm not saying there aren't times driving along, you'll just all of a sudden have a God thought and just start talking to the Lord. But I'm talking about typically our time, our activities are filled with everything but the awareness of God. Think about it. Being with God. Free from pain in heaven. Anybody think there's going to be any pain in heaven? No. Anybody think there'll be any disease? Any poverty? What is heaven? It's being with God. Anything else is speculation on our part. All we know for a fact is that heaven is being with God. It's relational. And we have access to that right here and right now. It just takes a different way of thinking. I'm, tell, I'm excited up here right now yes. because I'm thinking of the, pot the possibilities, yes. the potential. Yes. Right? I mean, we're, we're feeling something in us because why? And I'm not saying this for me. I'm saying because what I'm thinking, I'm feeling a witness. Yes. I'm feeling that God is saying, hey, long time, yes. no see. No, that's right. Come on, let's, let's get with the program here. Let's... Let's take advantage of this relationship that we have right here and right now. Yes. Praise the Lord. It's a kingdom. A kingdom where we are in perfect harmony with each other, with our Heavenly Father, yes. and even with the earth. Yes. He's told us what it can be. Yes. Jesus told us to pray for that reality on earth. Yes. Now, if we couldn't have it, He'd have been a liar to ask us to pray for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. This is ultimate maturity. Yes. 
Praise the Lord. This is a thing Paul talked about. This is a thing that I'm striving for. To reach that, to apprehend that which has apprehended me. God doesn't have a problem knowing that He's one with you. The problem is us knowing whether we're one with Him. God has apprehended me for that purpose. Now my job as a Christian is to apprehend what I have been apprehended by. In other words, to get it the way He got it. To understand it the way He understood it. It's, it's the ultimate maturity as a Christian and it's called living by faith yes. Yes. or walking by faith. Yes. Amen. There was a guy, a, a philosopher by the name of Blaise uh, Pascal and he lived in the 1600s. He died, he was only 39 years old when he died. Yeah. And he, hadn't, he had a book that was written after his death and it was all based on writings and journals and things that he'd had uh, up, up until his death. And this, this book was published after he died, and, th and it was all from these notes and things that he had had. One of his, he had what they call thought experience, experiments. And one of those experiments was called Pascal's Wager. And Pascal is recognized as the founder of the, what we call probability theories today. Pascal's wager is an argument for belief in God in the form of uh, risk-reward analysis. Now, that's what I love about Pascal is he's a philosopher, but he's a Christian. He's a believer. And they're rare. I mean, they really are. Because generally, they get into psychology and everything else. Is they don't even know if they exist, let alone God. So the point is, if you bet... His, his theory is if you bet that God doesn't exist and you lose, in other words, if you bet that He doesn't exist and He does exist, yeah. you lose. And not only do you lose, you lose everything. Yes. Exactly. You lose here, you lose the now, and you lose anything that might have ever been. Yes. Yes. All right? On the other hand, if you bet on God existing and you lose, in other words, if you bet on God and then find out that God doesn't exist, you don't lose anything. So it's a stupid bet to not believe God. Amen. To not give it a shot. Yes. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's his theory. This is how idiotic people can be. Yes. It's simply a win-win. Yes. Right. Yes. Amen. God wants us to live by faith. Yes. Yes. That's his argument. That, that's Pascal's argument in a simplified way. Is that, hey, just roll the dice, man. And if you're going to believe that God is, yes. is that he exists. What do you got to lose? The worst that can happen is nothing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Praise the Lord. And if He is, all the blessings of God are yours. Amen. That's right. See, he wants, God wants us to live by faith and experience Him. And He's made it possible for us to do exactly that. The just... Walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. See, everybody experiences the messes of life, the crap, the yeah. junk. And we also experience the mysteries of God. Yeah. So faith rises from a perspective of things hoped for but not yet seen. It's Pascal's argument. Believe. You've got nothing to lose. Don't believe, and you've lost everything. See, it's believing in things hoped for, but not yet seen. We are caught in the constant battle of life, the constant change, the, the constant altering of circumstances and situations and circumstances in life. It's, it's constant. I mean, it, the longer you live, the more you realize it. So the only way forward is through this difficult decision to trust and then step out on God's Word in spite of whatever it is you're dealing with. Faith, someone said it like this, faith is a beautiful, awkward reality. It's fantastic, but it's so awkward to operate in it while we're in this world, because the world is established on these things. Amen? In Acts chapter, oh, actually here, 
Let me tell you uh, quickly. Uh, Shakespeare wrote a uh, story called The Tempest, and in the second act, there's a, there's a scene where Antonio says to Sebastian, what's past is prologue. Praise the Lord. That is biblical. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Before Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. What passed is prologue. What was is the future. There's nothing in our lives that God didn't already know was coming. And that he hasn't already dealt with. Whatever your need, whatever your circumstance, it's not new to God. It's something he's been doing for eternity. When you walk by faith, you have the sense of, Tim said it this morning, the bigness of God. But you only have that when you walk by faith. Because otherwise he's no bigger than you are. Naturally speaking. See, God, not, only, not always do we uh, have knowledge about where our life is going, where God's taking us, but we're conscious that he is taking us somewhere, yes. that he somehow is in charge, even though we may not understand where I'm going to be a week from now, right. you know, geographically or spiritually or anything else. But in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, you don't have to go there for the sake of time, but Abraham is told by God, leave everything you understand, everything you know, and come to a place that I'll tell you about later. Get going, and I'll tell you when you get there. The life of faith, for me, has meant my feet are moving when I don't know where I'm going. Right? Right? I'm doing things that I don't know how to do. And I'm hoping, and I don't know why. Does that sound familiar to anybody besides me? Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 10. See, I thought I had it all figured out 30 years ago. But the further on the trail I got, the more I realized I didn't know the destination. I just know there is one. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he sojourned in the land of the promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So the, the, the kind of the metaphor here is Abraham's journey was in a place that wasn't really his or that he didn't connect with or understand anything about. He was looking for something spiritual. Amen? He was looking for a, build, a city whose builder and maker was God, but he was stuck with cities that were made by men. What God was trying to get across to Abraham and trying to get across to us through that story is, this is the way we have to live our lives. Not ruled by the things of this world, but by the things of the supernatural. Those that are built, whose builder and maker is God and not man. Praise the Lord. This This is that beautiful, awkward resolution to the mess of life. You don't own me. Right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's right. Praise God. The mystery of God and the challenge of authentic spirituality is what we're faced with. Mm-hmm. Thought y'all got going through different things yeah. and you thought it was about that thing. Yeah. And that's okay. But that thing was nothing but one more step yeah, that's right. towards that place that God has determined that and right. destined for yes. you to be. Yes. And that place is where God shows up. That's right. Glory. Yes. 
Yes. Praise the Lord. Are you with me? Yes. Amen. Yes. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only yes. true God, Jesus. and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. Heaven and eternity are relational realities. Yes. Just a couple of scriptures, and I'm going to wrap up. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 through 23. Heaven is, it's relational. Yes. That's the point he's trying to get us to understand. He's not trying to get us to a never-never land. Right. He's trying to get us to wake up yeah. to He is here. He yes. is with you. He is in you. You and He are one. Yes. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him. And for Him. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of His cross by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, by Him, I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, Yet now hath he reconciled one in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, and reprovable, amen, in his sight. If you continue in faith and settle and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel or get back into the body or back into the flesh, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So Paul saw keeping the faith as a continuation of the relationship that he had spent his entire life cultivating. Yeah. He understood the connection between this life and our internal or eternal, excuse me, relationships with God. Yeah. It's not this earth and then God. God's trying to say, hey, I got a part in this too. I have from the very beginning. This, our life here is about the relationship we have with God just like it will be for eternity. Yes. Yes. E Heaven. Eternity. It enters this life wherever, whenever Jesus enters. Yeah. You are Jesus in this earth. But only if you know it. So the degree in which God invades earth or infects the earth or affects the earth or affects the earth is determined by us. So real biblical understanding acknowledges both the fact that I am a material being and I am an immaterial being. Mm -hmm. In other words, I have substance, and yet I don't have. Yes. I, I can be affected by space and time and energy and all that, but I don't have to be affected right. by it. Right. I have a choice where the average human being, the unsaved human being, has no choice. They're just subject to whatever the world throws at them. That's what they're, yeah. they've got to deal with. Mm. So... I see, I see the, the body and the spirit the way Jesus taught it, which is holistically, which is that God designed us to inhabit both at the same time. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we don't have any right to be here on the earth or to operate in the earth. So in Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, Paul said, All things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, are being reconciled to the Father. How? Through Jesus Christ. All right, look again, Colossians 1 16 and 17. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth. Visible, invisible, whether they're thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and by Him 
all things consist. So those are the all things, right? Our faith doesn't end when we doubt. Faith is not the absence of doubt. It's the remedy to doubt. Everything in this earth, no matter what they are, they're subject to us who are in Christ. I don't care what it is. You can't give me something that we don't have authority over. Sin, sickness, disease, poverty. What? I, I don't care what it is. If they're in this earth or they're in heaven, I've got authority over it. Now, that's a, that takes a leap of faith. But that's the truth. And it's more than just saying it. We've got to believe it and act on it. Just because you have a doubt doesn't mean you don't have faith. Right. If you have a doubt, that's a reason to exercise faith. Because right. that's what will drive the doubt out. Yeah. It doesn't make you a failure because you doubt. Nope. It's just, it's like the blinking light that says, yeah. put some water in. You know, add some oil. Yeah. Right? It's the warning. Mm -hmm. yeah. Something's trying to get access here right. that doesn't deserve access. Right. Fear, yep. doubt. Mm -hmm. yep. Only God. In fact, only a God who, who has been trusted can show himself trustworthy. Yep. True. Yes. If you don't trust him, you'll never find out. Yeah. You'll never know. That's true. Praise the Lord. All right, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. And we'll wrap up with the scriptures we started with. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. I really am wrapping this up. Praise the Lord. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Jesus Christ. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. 1 John 3.2 Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we shall, He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. So to be born again, a person has to enter and reap where they never labored. Am I right? It's a gift. It's a free gift. You didn't do anything to get it other than to believe. Praise the Lord. 1 Peter 1.23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, that liveth and abideth forever. In other words, eternal. It's not affected by time or space or any of the other things. It's eternal, right? So we were born again from seed that we didn't plant. Right? right? Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. We didn't sow seed to be born. Right. Mm -hmm. We were born because somebody else sowed seed, sure. and we are the fruit of that seed. Yes. This is true in the natural, yes. right? So, our features, what we look like, are part of our inheritance produced by somebody else's seed. Remember, Jesus is talking about language here that we would relate to, that we would hopefully understand, that would help us to see into the supernatural. So, it's true that we are new creatures in Christ, created in the image and the likeness of God by seed that he sowed. Mm -hmm. Our being in this world, as our Father is in heaven, is an inheritance provided for us by the seed that God planted. Yeah. Being confined to the time of this world and this universe makes it hard to imagine existing outside of it. Right. Praise the Lord. But heaven is not so much a different place, just a different way of living, just a different way of existing. 
a way that you have to live by faith. Last scripture, 1 John 4, 16 and 17. So just like somebody else's seed made me look the way I look today. Well, it had some help. I've done a few good things and bad things for this over the years. But nevertheless, whatever it looks like, I had nothing to do with it. It looks like what it looks like because of somebody else. Right? I pray the Father and He shall give you another comforter that He may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth Him not, neither knoweth Him. But you know Him because He dwells within you and shall be with you and shall be in you. Praise the Lord. The result is, as He is, so are we in this present world. We are God's offspring. We are eternal. We are carriers of eternity and the supernatural. We look like God because we're His offspring. We didn't do anything for it. It's just the reality. But a lot of us are like children who were adopted but never knew their natural parents. And we feel like, I don't look like them, but I don't know what I'm supposed to look like. And God says, when you see yourself as I've created you to be, as my seed has intended you to be, you'll see me. And you'll look just like me. You'll know who you are. You'll know what your inheritance is. You'll know what your power is. Heaven is ours, but it's ours right now. Not after 90 or 100 years of life. It's here, and it's now, and it's ours. It belongs to us. It's who we are. It's what we are. And the rest of this is all the enemy's facade. It's all an illusion to keep us from seeing who and what we really are. I know that might sound kind of dark and dismal, but the truth is, everything in this world is designed to keep you from believing who you really are in Christ. That's what the devil uses. He uses human beings just like God does. He just uses them in the opposite way. So every time you hear, oh, we don't do that. You know, how are you going to raise the dead? How are you going to do this? It just comes natural to us. It's what we are. It's who we are. And why would we be ashamed or afraid of being embarrassed for doing what we are, what we know we really are? It's not up to us to do it. It's just up to us to look through the glass and see who we really are. And unless we're willing to step out in faith and do the things that God says we're capable of doing, nobody will ever see it. It's kind of the old cliche. You know, uh, if you shoot at the moon, you think, well, you'll never hit it. Well, you might hit a star in the process. You know, you may not get what you're aiming for, but if you don't have a goal, yeah. you'll, you'll hit something every time. It just won't be what you're after. And the goal is that God would be manifest, that God would be identified, that God would be seen. Yes, I mean, we want people healed. We want to see people delivered. We want people to get up off of deathbeds and all of that we want. But we're, we're coming at this thing backwards. This is God's purpose. It isn't just, it's not just like I have this whim or that, that Don and his family have this love for a brother that they, they want to see. Yeah, of course we want that. But the, tr- the truth is, this is God's purpose and God's plan in this world. Not just our emotions, not just our desires. It's what God is. It's what God does. It's what identifies him. Don't innately knew that. And Doke, believe me, he's, he may be not functioning in that body, but he's not absent from the Lord, I guarantee you. And the, the conversations I had with him at the funeral and then at, uh, at church here that day that he came, listen, here's a guy who's believing. And he's, he's ready to roll the dice. And I don't mean that negatively. I mean he's willing to take the risk. He's willing to do what he has to do in order for this to take place. Am I against doctors? And st- no, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, 
in order for God to be revealed, there are times when we need more than doctors. Because the doctors will end up getting the credit. Thank God for doctors. But God is wanting to be revealed in this world. And somebody, somebody has got to see themselves. It sounds like the height of egotism. But that's what they jumped on Jesus about. You know, who do you think you are? You're talking like you think you're God. That's why we're going to condemn you is because you say you and your father are one. That's what God's telling us we're supposed to be doing. I heard somebody, I, 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 I'm going to quit. I heard somebody say this just the other day, and it was in terms of, uh, of politics, but it's true. It's true for, for religion, too. If, if all we want to do is argue, all we're going to get is an argument. Yeah. Somebody needs to show up. Yes. Right? I mean, we, I, I'm for all the Bible study and everything we can get, but if it doesn't motivate us, Beyond just going to a church service a couple times a month. Right. We're missing the whole point here. There are miracles that God wants released. There are supernatural realities that God wants people to experience. And if you think that God's just going to come down here arbitrarily and do things, He's not. He's done everything He's going to do. It's up to us. We, uh, we I just bring this to everyone's attention. We just got a text from the hospital, and they have determined that he is brain dead. So, uh, as far as they're concerned, case closed. Now, as far as I'm concerned, he's going to be fine. And you hit something on the head. There's a guy that would have been willing, and I'm not sure he didn't have an inkling, that he would go through this to bring God to glory. Yes. Right. Yes. The man that was blind, they said, whose sin is this? Yes. This is no one's sin. Right. This is so that God gets the glory. Yes. And it's time that this little Amen. group of people Amen. that believe see. Yes. I, I don't really care about the doctors because they'll find an excuse or oh, yeah. something, you know, and there's always going to be somebody that says, well, I just can't believe it. I'm sorry for you, but yeah. we're all going to yes. know yes. this is this is Almighty God. This Absolutely. Everything I've said today, everything that was yeah. said prior to me getting up here, is about look because I know what goes through your mind is the same thing that goes through my mind. Right now. Yeah. Sure. That's why I say doubt does not interfere with God. It does motivate us then to operate by faith. When that doubt comes, and I'm thinking, oh my God, what this and that and the other thing, and what you know what this is. That's when I say, shut the hell up, devil, because God has already spoken and he has the last word. And then we're going to focus on that and we're going to believe just like Job. If Job, if Job knew anything, he said, look, though these skin worms devour me, yet I will praise the Lord. Hallelujah. No matter what it looks like here, I'm going to keep on praising the Lord. I'm going to keep on believing God and God's going to move because of that. Because that's who God is. So the devil is a liar. Dope is alive. Amen. And God's going to get the glory for it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. If we're too timid and too afraid to step out and say things for fear that it might come back on us, we're in the wrong business. Yes, we are. He wins either way. He's absolutely. Because the scripture is true in the spirit and in the natural. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So yes. that's what I'm saying about Doke. He's not being influenced no. by the physical. No. No. Because he's, sto- he's totally spirit right now. Yes. Praise the Lord. His faith hasn't gone anywhere. No. He's, he's believing just like he believed before. And yes. as we say, no matter what happens, yes. he's with the Lord. Yes. The question is, are we? Yeah. And we have the same opportunity, yes. amen, right now. Amen. To be with the Lord. To be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. To be present with the Lord means no sickness, no disease, no dying. Right? Right? Right. So I just suggest get out of the body and get in the spirit. Amen. Believe God. Confess what God has said. That will keep you in the spirit, absent from the body and present with the Lord. And wherever God is, 
anything can happen. Yes. All things can happen. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise God. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Yep. Hallelujah. They said, well, he's been dead three days, right? Yeah. Jesus said, just roll the stone away. Absolutely. Just move the hindrance. Move the thing that's causing you to believe wrong. Amen. Come on out. That's true. Praise the Lord. Amen.